did medieval people have pets? And if they did, what kind of pets did they have? The most important animal, I think, for men, both high and low status, was the dog. Nobles kept hunting dogs in particular to show their status and because hunting was a very important part of noble society. Ordinary people kept dogs too. Uh, these were technically not supposed to be for hunting. As you can imagine, people did hunt with them. If you lived in the forest, you were allowed to keep a dog, but the dog had to often be declawed so that it was less effective at hunting. I would imagine that there were plenty of dogs that weren't actually declawed though, that were kept somewhere, kept out of the way. But technically you're supposed to have a declawed hound for uh, use and looking after you in the forest, within the forest environment. You were allowed to have guard dogs. And of course, dogs act as guard dogs and companions for working people who were swine herds or shepherds. A dog could be very, very useful, keep the sheep together. Sheep dogs existed in the medieval period. I'm not sure how well trained they were, but my guess is probably about as well trained as sheep dogs are today. Possibly not quite the same breed or quite the same speciality, but they definitely had sheep dogs. And swine herds had pig dogs, I guess you call them, um, that kept the, uh, the, the pigs in, uh, in tow as well. And as today, lots of farmers just have companion dogs that go around with them doing things. It also seems that um, builders and navvies and people constructing stuff had hounds too. A note about labourers' dogs, which is interesting, specifically says they were mongrels, spelt with a U, mongrels, and they looked after the bags and bottles of their masters. And that's quite sweet. Greyhounds are mentioned quite a lot. They're seen in the um, illustrations and they're written about in the literature. And these pretty much similar to modern day grey greyhounds, fairly gracile type of dog. Sight hounds used for flushing out game and general hunting. There was a type of beast which isn't really around anymore uh, called an alaunt. Alaunt. And this was described as a very heavy set type of greyhound with a big head, a very massive head. These are considered to be bigger than mastiffs. Uh, so I don't know whether the breed is fully extinct or what they're actually describing, but these were used for flushing out bear, for example, and were considered to be the sort of the big dog, if you like, the, the, the biggest hunting dog possible. There were smaller ones, spaniels, for example, that are named after their place of origin, Spain. Spaniels were used for uh, hunting uh, game birds, particularly on water and for retrieving. So there are all sorts of types of dog that we would potentially recognize today, although the breeding wasn't nearly as specialized. And in fact, arguably a lot of modern breeds have gone way beyond the functional form for actual hunting jobs. There's another note about a launce from the same writer. He talks about them being fed on the foul things from the butcher's shop. I just think that's great. I presume that's the ultimately nasty bits left over from butchery. Uh, obviously, uh, offal was eaten by people. I'm not quite sure what would have been left over, but I guess some of it's so inedible for humans that you would feed it to your giant dogs or something. Anyway, foul stuff found in the butcher's shop is suitable for a launce, if you ever have one. A 14th century writer described the ideal dog. He should be courageous and kindly, follow the commands of his master. He should be courteous to all of his fellows, but he was allowed to be fierce towards wild beasts. Posh dogs, dogs kept by the nobility, were treated exceptionally well. Gaston de Foix, in his book on hunting dogs, talks about them having a kennel kept off the floor, built of wood. It talks about them being exercised daily. It talks about them having a, um, a, a, a fireplace, if you like, a, a way to keep warm in the winter. So they were possibly treated an awful lot better 
than the nobility's servants or peasants even. Dogs were very important to the nobility. Gaston de Foix also talks about a small boy being required to live in the kennels at night. Sounds a bit uh, awful if you ask me, but his job was to stop the dogs from fighting at night and to make sure they were kept warm. So perhaps he kept warm as well with blankets, but it doesn't sound like a particularly nice job to be a small boy in charge of a kennel. As we've already said, Women, particularly high status women, maintained lap dogs. They kept lap dogs, but they were also criticized, as you can imagine. Certain people suggested that it was a, uh, a distraction. It would keep them away from more valuable pursuits. The specific quote is, lap dogs are instruments of folly and idleness that distract women from more commendable exercises. The critic goes on to suggest that they delight more in their lap dogs than they do in their children. But nonetheless, plenty of powerful women are shown in paintings with their lap, prized lap dogs. The lap dogs themselves look very small, they're a bit ferret-like actually, and it's sometimes hard to tell what kind of beast they might be, but they do look like small terrier type of, uh, from a modern perspective, small pointed nose terrier type things. Not dissimilar than today really. There's a type of animal I've not spoken about much, and that's because cats have a very mixed reputation in the medieval period. They're associated with witchcraft, but they're also kept by noble women. They're used in a domestic situation to keep mice and rats down, so they're very practical. Uh, the Pope suggests you shouldn't keep them for a while, but broadly speaking, they were very useful. They were the kind of flip side to dogs. You couldn't really train them to do anything specifically, but they were very useful to keep down mice in particular, but also rats, which were going to be everywhere in the medieval countryside and medieval towns and villages. Perhaps more so in towns actually than in villages. So cats were kept, but most of them were probably outdoor creatures that had to fight for a corner of an indoor place and were sort of yard cats as might be described today. I know some people that keep horses that have what they call a yard cat. That cat's semi-feral, uh, is sort of looked after, fed, kept an eye on, but isn't, doesn't come and sit in with the family and get looked after like a pet. So I'm not sure you could describe most medieval cats as pets in particular. I think they would fall more into the working animal side of things. I haven't really talked about birds of prey as such. Uh, I think they could fall into the category of pet, but very much they were associated with hunting. The type of bird of prey you had was associated with your status. You know, kings had eagles and emperors had eagles, that kind of thing. The rules were widely flaunted. They were written about, but I would imagine you had a practical bird that you wanted to look after. And um, if it was about hunting, catching rabbits or whatever it might be, you would have the right bird for the job. A whole specific area of discussion, I think, birds of prey, were they pets? Well, some of them are these days, but again, I think they fall into the category of hunting animal, utility animal, that is appreciated more than a pet as such. Of course, it might not surprise you to know that kings kept pets. One of the most famous of these was Henry VIII. Now, Henry VIII was a very savvy king. He seemed to be very aware of the political side of kingship. Uh, he was also quite a good manipulator of public opinion. He kept pets at the Tower of London. They were on public display some of the time. Uh, these were often exotic animals that were uh, given to him as, uh, as gifts. And so the poor beasts were probably not particularly well or carefully looked after. They probably didn't know what they're supposed to do with an elephant or with a polar bear or whatever, or a lion, whatever. They were probably there, probably more like sideshows and the poor animals probably didn't last very long. I haven't been able to find out much detail about them, but they were very much not pets. They were displays of power and control. The last bear in England was killed in around 1240 and the last wolf in England around 1390. Some people say wolves lasted a lot longer in Scotland up until the 18th century, but uh, the records are sparse about that and 
you know, but they weren't around very much in the medieval period. So if you were going hunting, unless it was the early medieval period, you're not gonna be hunting bears in England and wolves, possibly you could hunt wolves in certain more remote parts of England. Remember there were lots of settlements. There wasn't really too much uh, wilderness left in England by the middle of the medieval period. Last but not least, and this was really interesting for me. I discovered it when I was doing the research for this. Priests and nuns keeping pets. There's a whole other area. Let me explain because it's really good fun. Monks keeping pets seems to be practiced quite widely, but also officially frowned upon by the higher ups. I don't know whether it's just to keep control of them or, or whether they genuinely were prevented from doing so. But there's an archbishop who said, no member of our household shall keep a pet dog or a songbird as a pet. And there is another abbot that specifically forbade dogs, bunny rabbits, and small songbirds to be kept as pets, which I guess indicates that those are exactly the kind of pets that monks were keeping. Pets like ravens, squirrels, and bears are mentioned in abbey records as being kept as pets. Keeping a bear as a pet seems quite extreme for a monk, but uh, that's what it says. Um, and in the 13th century, uh, the Bishop of Durham apparently kept a pair of monkeys for his spiritual enlightenment. So there you go, there's a very senior member of the cloth keeping monkeys as pets, and that was considered okay. So I guess it varied widely from religious house to religious house, the kind of pets you could have. But they mentioned bunny rabbits, songbirds, ravens, bears, <laughs> dogs, obviously. Cats don't get mentioned very much in the uh, rules on religious pets. But it seems like, for me anyway, doing this research, that the um, religious people had the most diverse set of pets you could possibly imagine. Ordinary people had practical pets, sensible, normal ones. Monks seem to have gone a bit wild. I mean, bears and ravens, they're pretty cool pets. Even saints kept pets. In the 12th century, a chap called Waldef, who became Saint Waldef, kept a pet horse. And this pet horse had a name, Grizzle, or Grizzel, G-R-I-Z-Z-E-L. Not much more written about it than that, but I think the idea of a saint having a pet horse is excellent. And finally, it appears that medieval people also brought their pets to church. Now, there's a complaint, a written complaint from a priest saying that the ordinary people were bringing, bringing their dogs and puppies to church. And these were running around and barking and distracting everybody and sometimes eating the holy books. So the idea of people's chaotic pets running around the church while there's something very serious going on at the front and lots of people at the back talking dogs running around hither and yon disrupting the service i think is is a wonderful color and sufficiently distracting for that one priest hundreds and hundreds of years ago to write a letter of complaint pets were important to people and it seems that the more time you had on your hands the more kinds of pets and more varied pets you could keep it's fascinating that religious people seem to have kept more exotic pets. Perhaps they had more time on their hands, I don't know. Ordinary people kept arguably more practical pets and the nobility had pets for status as much as anything else. Just like today, some people use pets as a status symbol and uh, other people keep pets as companions and it keeps them happy. And long may that continue. <laughs>